Welcome to our sixth and final session, COVID-19, COVID What We Learned in China, featuring Ms. Revathy Advaithi, CEO of Flex, a global manufacturer. Our moderator is HBS professor Willie Shi, also a board member of Flex. Uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, Ravathi Advaithi is the Chief Executive Officer of Flex, a global manufacturing partner that helps uh, a diverse customer base design and build products in 30 countries around the world. Uh, I know her because I'm on the board of Flex, as Andy mentioned, and I was part of the process that brought her to the company. She assumed the CEO, CEO role just a little over a year ago in February 19, 2019, so it's been a pretty eventful year for her. Prior to Flex, she was president and chief operating officer for the electrical sector business for Eaton. And she worked her way up from the shop floor, being in manufacturing her whole career. So those of you who know me know why I like her. Now, I know all of you RCs and ECs who have joined us as well know a little about Flex because we did a case on the Sharvar Hungary site. Today, we're going to talk more about COVID-19 and the impact on global manufacturing and supply chains. So Ravathi, maybe let me start here. I know you faced a lot of challenges in your career, and you've said this, this has been not, like nothing that you have ever seen. Uh, since Flex is, has factories in China, perhaps you could talk about the early days as this whole thing started to unfold in January. What was it like, and what did we learn there? Yeah, so Willie, thanks for having me. And, um, you know, nothing better than talking to a whole bunch of uh, students today takes me away from my day to day life. So I'm excited to do this and hope you all have some uh, fun questions. You know, I'd say when it first started, if you think about uh, early January in China, you know, a lot of us were thinking about it like it was going to be like SARS, you know, or Ebola. And um, and so our thought process, even as we were preparing for it, uh, was kind of with that mindset that we need to be aware, we need to have a game plan. My first meeting, I still vividly remember this, um, on, on this happened on January 13th. And, um, you know, with our operations team and interestingly enough, our operations team was traveling to, to China that day when we talked about the outbreak um, in China, what had what we had been hearing through the Christmas holidays um, and then kind of the first known fatalities started arriving um, just around that that period of time. So. Immediately then we started thinking about a game plan for, for China, knowing that it was going to be um, the, the most critical place at that point. We weren't thinking of it as a global pandemic for sure. Um, and uh, the first uh, news about how significant it was going to be was when you know the Wuhan area went into shutdown and an extended um, uh, New Year break was announced by the authorities. Um, so our first view on it, Willie, right away was to say, you know, we have around 40 plus thousand people, employees in China. Um, our team, uh, you know, was very connected with the whole team. And in a matter of days, they were able to say, where had the 40,000 people gone during the Chinese New Year? Where were the hotspots for uh, where we were seeing the illness and how do we start thinking about bringing people back in and who were we going to say, you know, don't come back in because you're in the hot spot. So we were very organized right in the beginning and used the time frame of the Chinese New Year to really coordinate our response back for our employees that were coming back. And just to give you a perspective, you know, by the time, um, you know, two weeks after Chinese New Year, we had probably brought back 70 plus percent of our workforce. And this included, we were putting around 16,000 people that we were taking through a quarantine process because many of our facilities, the cities required us to take people through a 14 day quarantine process. Um, so it was a very, very significant logistical effort, but we acquired PPE, we acquired temperature scanners, now, we put all a personal protection as the forefront of bringing people back in. And our initial view was, we're going to see how this goes. If we feel like we can't control and manage the environment within our facilities, we're going to go to, you know, a different game plan. And thankfully, our very robust system worked well. Um, and in a few weeks, as Chinese New Year ended and we started getting people back, we knew that very good personal protection 
processes will be effective in managing through this. And then, of course, since then, we've had almost 90% of our uh, Chinese workforce back and working uh, in our facilities. So I would say put your employees first was the most important. Have very rigid uh, safety precautions and personal protective precautions and pe bringing people back in. Um, and that at least gets your factories running. And then, of course, Willie, as you know, we went from that to the, the huge issue with supply chain and then the after effects that came in terms of managing the supply chain, the shortages of parts, um, and then the, the usual effect you see in terms of the whiplash effect on, on supply chain. So, but first and foremost, we were very effective in bringing our employees back. And then second, we went into managing and mitigating our supply chain risk which very quickly peaked to be the crisis uh, that we were managing because the effect of having a supply chain impact in China that not only affects your factories in China, but it affects everything you do globally because there's a significant part of our products that come from China. Um, so it went from in a war room of managing operations and bringing people back in to war room of managing supply chain and how do we handle that and take it from kind of the peak of um, having shortages and supplier shutdowns to to mitigating that. So I'll pause there, really, and see um, whether that answers your question. Yeah. So let me just follow up on that piece. Uh, I mean, in China before, we've seen SARS, we've seen uh, H1N1 and so on. Do you think uh, that helped in our response because we've sort of been through this before? Not, Of course, not at this scale. Yeah, absolutely, because I, uh, our team already had the experience of having gone through SARS and uh, uh, H1N1 and had a viewpoint of how this could be managed. So it was definitely a different proposition uh, than everywhere else in the world. Uh, we can talk about Italy in a second, but that definitely played into helping. The idea of getting masks and temperature scans didn't seem like a new norm, right, to the culture and how people operated there. They were very quick to adapt and go to that environment. Um, and so that was definitely helpful. You see the same in Singapore, um, you know, why that was effective in places like Singapore. So that definitely was played a big role in people adapting to the change quickly, uh, and then our team being able to react with the game plan also. Yeah, and, and how about some of our suppliers in China? Do you think uh, they were equally able to react, or was there a variation across the range? I would say there's variation across the range. We did see, um, you know, several parts of our supply chain declare force majeure as they just couldn't get enough products to keep their factories running. Um, we also saw there was very much differentiation uh, in the expectation of how you brought employees back in. Uh, let me just give you a statistic here for uh, if you looked at our workforce as of yesterday, um, we probably have done 5 million plus temperature scans as an example. So you had to be very, very effective in bringing that type of work practice in before you could bring people back in and not all suppliers had that capability. Um, so I would say a combination not having that logistical capability in terms of personal protection, but also being able to deal with the supply chain whiplash, you know, affected a lot of our suppliers. Um, you know, we saw our, as you know, Willie, we have a huge supply chain and, and logistics footprint. Um, we saw that uh, we had never seen that kind of shortage uh, ever in the history of this company. That's how significant it was. Um, and a lot of our suppliers, you know, had to declare force majeure and manage through it uh, in different ways, didn't have the same capability to see, see it through. Yeah. And then, as you mentioned, of course, it spread to Italy and our factories there were in a hard hit region. Correct. And, you know, interestingly, so I think Italy was early March, uh, sometime around March 3rd, March, March 4th, uh, right after the, to the big football game that we saw the outbreak in Italy. Um, and I was traveling in Europe at that time when, when the Italy issue started. And nobody thought of the mag first is nobody thought Italy, right? And second is the magnitude of Italy we didn't predict in early March. And for us, what was interesting is the our engineering team for our medical business is headquartered out of Italy in Milan. 
Um, and so we immediately had to start thinking about, you know, how do we do work from home practices? How do we have our engineering teams maybe take some equipment home so they could work from home and still support the medical crisis that we were seeing? Um, and then we had a factory and a logistics uh, warehouse in Milan in that area that we had to think about how we were operating. But the magnitude of Italy was quickly seen, I would say, in two weeks, right? Because we went from, you know, between March 4 to, to late March, um, the impact on Italy was significant in terms of number of cases. Um, so we went into a full shutdown in, in Italy. We did not even try to bring people back into our facilities uh, because the risks were too high. Um, so different practices used. And then, you know, we had our R&D teams work from home. Like I said, we shipped a lot of equipment to their houses so they could work from home, you know, to do some of the research work that was required. But the China playbook has been then deployed across every uh, country that we have seen the shutdown. So we use the same playbook for Italy as we're bringing people back in, shipped in masks, temperature scanners. So by early March, we had positioned every factory across the world with personal protection, temperature scanning, all the ground logistics across every factory. So this is 120 plus factory, 170,000 employees across the world had that position if it was needed. And so we were able to use that in Italy effectively. Yeah, now you've mentioned kind of this kind of broad impact on global supply chains on, on the supply side. Uh, what about on the demand side? Yes, yeah, so in the terms way of I demand think, for product. Yeah, so uh, you know, I'll step, uh, just step back and think about the whole supply chain effect for a second because, um, you know, I think even prior to this, as the trade impact was being felt, you know, there was some change in terms of supply chain thinking and how the world was operating. Um, and de-risking supply chain. So I think of this in phases, right? The first and most important aspect of supply chain was be transparent, understand what the impact is, make sure you under, figure out where you can get alternate sources of supply, um, uh, figure out your available inventory, how much do you have available, how much can you ship around. But then the second part of it, how do you understand real customer demand? Because all of you know who have studied supply chain that the first thing that happens when there is shortage in the world is everybody increases their demand very quickly because they feel that that's the best way to get, get more product. And that is the reverse effect of what you should actually see. So for us, it was very important. You know, we have very, very detailed um, analytics around, um, around supply and demand. And we were very quickly able to understand how the end market impact was going to be on certain customers and able to go back to them and talk to them about, hey, listen, we think that you should take down your demand by 30%. Or in some cases, like in the case of medical or critical infrastructure, that you should, your, your demand's going to go up by another 12, 15, 20%. Um, so we have a very diverse footprint of customers. And so we had to go by our top 300 customers on a case by case basis and say, here's how we think based on our analysis, your demand should be adjusted. Some accepted it, some didn't accept it because March was too early for some people to see the, the magnitude of what was happening here. Uh, but since then we've had great customer co cooperation to correct demand because that's a significant an important step in correcting this whiplash effect that the world will see in supply chain. Yeah, now you mentioned uh, Flex makes products for a number of medical products companies. Can you talk to us about what's happened on that front? Yes, a lot has happened on the medical front. So just to give you a view of what Flex does on the medical side, we're probably the 12th largest um, medical device manufacturer in the world, right? Little known fact. Um, but uh, we make, uh, think of almost any medical device product, we probably make that for um, hospitals across the world. And so we work with medical equipment companies, with pharmaceuticals, with hospitals. Uh, we're probably in every hospital in the world. So the first thing we saw is, of course, a, a major surge in demand itself uh, for the products that we make. And then like oxygenators, uh, beds, you know, even products like that were increasing across the world. Then there was a huge push on ventilators. 
Um, so I'll just talk a little bit about ventilators. It's been so much in the news and there's so much conversation around ventilators, but just some basic facts, right? Typically, the world produces around 30,000 ventilators across the world. That's the amount of ventilators that are uh, that were produced before this. And so now, as you know, right, hundreds and thousands, millions of ventilators are suddenly needed in a um, segment of the market that is not used to fast qualification of products for all the right reasons, right? FDA approved big regulatory requirements. It typically takes... 12 months at a minimum, maybe 24 months for a factory to ramp up for a product to qualify. Um, and so we had to jump on early on. This was around six to eight weeks ago. And really, every major ventilator manufacturer came to us and said, what could you do to scale up and do that really quickly? So in a matter of six weeks, we have been scaling up factories across the world for ventilator production that are already FDA approved. Um, and trying to take this from an 18-month cycle now to a six-week cycle before we can ramp up and start uh, producing product from our facilities, which are now starting to ship out. Um, so a huge change in terms of how the segment operates, how the customers are operating, how the government is working, functioning with us uh, to really put an all-out effort to make sure we have enough ventilators in the market. And of course, it is not enough, right? You can see from all the stories that you're hearing that anything we do is not enough yet, um, you know, in the, in, in the case of ventilators. So a lot of work going on, Willie, in terms of ramping up um, our production for this particular uh, product. Uh, in a couple of minutes, we're gonna open it up for questions. So if you uh, in the audience have questions, uh, you can think about those now and uh, we're gonna uh, ask you to raise your hand for those. Let me continue on the, the medical products front, uh, are there kind of particular challenges of working across borders? Because I mean, we have factories distributed all over the world and you know, uh, there's there's been a lot of debate about allocating products and things like that. Yes, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of uh, noise in this uh, equation, right? Whether it is uh, uh, in countries or even within states and countries, um, you know, in terms of coordinating with local governments, federal governments, um, so we can really get to the understanding of how does this product get eventually distributed. So we're coordinating with our customers, we're coordinating with the likes of FEMA, we're coordinating with the likes of local governments, so we can really be clear in terms of uh, making sure they understand where the end product goes. Um, but there is a lot of noise around this. I mean, there is, I get a lot of calls from government officials who want to know if, hey, if my product is made is in this factory in this state, can I just take it for that particular state? Um, and we have to constantly remind people that uh, that's not how it works, right? Uh, every country has a process of how they're distributing, allocating product. Customers have their own allocation methodology. Um, and we have to follow that to the best we can. Um, so it is a lot of coordination with communities, government, um, customers, kind of all stakeholders. This is a 24 seven effort, you know, for a team that we're quickly scaling up significantly. So it's not a small exercise at all. Yeah, it, it seems like a lot of people have come to us looking for help to build products in a hurry. Do you have some thoughts on that because, you know, uh, some of the ideas are probably better baked than others. Yeah, so, you know, we're, we're, we're not only making ventilators, we're also making testing equipment and we're also helping with the vaccination immunization effort. So we have work going on on all three fronts. Um, you know, initially, as we looked at this, even now, we're getting a lot of phone calls from people who want us to help with their product, redesign it, remake it, or to some effect. On the ventilator side, we have taken the stand that we're going to work with FDA approved products because there is so much homegrown product out there today by many universities, by many people, uh, that the qualification one takes long. And what is missing in the, these cases, the ventilator design itself is not complex, right? Anybody who's an engineer can see that it doesn't take a lot to design a ventilator. But the actual expertise is in the clinical expertise, right? So understanding 
understanding the pathology, understanding the what is needed for the patient makes different levels of ventilators, right? So that is important. And the clinical expertise is missed in many of these local homegrown ventilators that are coming in. Not saying that it can't be effective, but it's going to be effective in a different case in a different scenario. So we've taken the approach that we're going to focus our effort on FDA approved products that already exist, great products, and ramp those up full fledged um, so we can have you know, high quality products in the marketplace as quickly as we can. So we're using that on a case by case basis. Different on testing, on testing, we're do- willing to do a lot of experimentation you know, with uh, people who are bringing out test equipment and the same on vaccinations. Yeah, and uh, but on ventilators, even the uh, approved designs, you still have to work the whole supply chain for. All the components. We have to work the, that's right. We have to work the whole supply chain. We have to also work FDA almost on a day-to-day basis to relax certain regulatory requirements and certain approval requirements, and they have been amazing in that, uh, you know, or what's happening in Europe and, and other countries also. So we have to work with all stakeholders, um, you know, to, and most importantly is test equipment. That is the bottleneck in the supply chain of bringing up ventilators because you need equipment to test the ventilators and those are the complex machines actually. So a lot of our bottleneck is actually on test equipment. Do, do we build that test equipment or do you buy it or where does it come from? Well, we we have been uh, building some ourselves now because um, we buy some and in the past we haven't built it, but now, you know, everybody has to help out. So we're stepping in and helping build uh, subcomponents or parts of the test equipment or the equipment itself. So it's basically everybody who can help jumps in and pitches in to, to do a part of it. Yeah. Should we uh, open it up for questions, uh, Andy? Andy, you're on mute. Uh, I see one question in chat from Larissa DeLima. How do you see supply chain challenges scaling from what you faced in China to challenges that may be further ahead as this has become a global pandemic? Yeah, so how is... Oh, Larissa, you're you're on now. Sorry, Larissa. Well, let's go with my version of Larissa's question then. <laughs> so I see it in I almost see it in two different phases. The challenge with the crisis in China is China is the the center point of the world supply chain, right? So they make a lot of critical components for the whole world. So when China is shut down, it affects the whole world in one way or the other. So managing China, not only from our factories, but getting our supply chain up and running was critically, critically important. Now, as it spreads outside of China, the supply chain effect will still be felt because we obviously have suppliers across the world, but will be much smaller scale than what we have seen coming out of China. So that's how kind of I see the effect transferring from China to the rest of the world. So you can actually see, right, our number of shortages are cut by half, even though more of the world is shut down today than it was 30 days ago. Um, and that's kind of the, the impact of China being, you know, the center of a lot of um, uh, products that everybody gets. Another question, please, from uh, Akash Shah. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Uh, I wanted to ask about the bullwhip effect. What do you expect what what happens in terms of normalization after the crisis? How long do you think uh, a lot of these will take to become normal? And then what do you think the new normal will be like? Do you expect more uh, regional supply chains or do you expect it to completely go back to a global supply chain? So Akash, two parts of the question. One is in terms of the actual effect, um, you know, of how long this takes to stabilize. 
you know, history has shown certain, um, you know, certain um, thought process in terms of how long this takes, but we have to put history aside in this case because the magnitude of what we saw in terms of number of shortages and the actual effect on suppliers is something the world hasn't seen. So in our mind, we thought China was going to take at least three months to normalize, you know, from March. Much to our surprise, China normalized a whole lot quicker than what we thought. So we're, I would say we're back to 70% of our supply base back to normal in terms of China and demand being corrected. So it corrects the whole bullwhip effect. Um, but we think that if you look at the whole world, this is at least going to take six months at a minimum, um, you know, to for this to normalize from a kind of supply chain effect. And that's a minimum. In some cases, it will be longer than six months if shutdowns continue for a prolonged period post summer. So our planning right now is in Q4 of this calendar year, we think that we'll see a normalization of supply chain. In terms of regionalization, so that um, uh, train had left the station with the trade issue, right? And when the trade issue had started, uh, there was a whole lot of regionaliz regionalization conversation that had started in C-suites across the world. Um, and our view is that um, that trend continues. Uh, it'll probably accelerate the conversation to some extent. Uh, more than anything else, but you're going to see that conversation taken even outside of China is what is going to be really important and different because what people are seeing today is, for example, Malaysia being shut down, right? Malaysia has been shut down now for two weeks, extended for another two weeks and really managing it very differently than China. And that has a huge effect on, on a lot of our customers, diverse customers across the globe. So we're gonna see people not only managing regionalization out of China, you're gonna see regionalization getting managed out of any country that doesn't have a good regulatory environment, a stable political environment that has the capability to manage crises like this, we're going to start to see regionalization driven even outside of those countries. So we're thinking an acceleration uh, for sure, what came from the trade, but also um, a movement across from China to other countries across the world. Next question, please. Isabella Carbonell. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my question was about ramping up personnel uh, to meet this high demand and what lessons you have learned from having to do this so quickly. Yeah, Isabella, so, um, you know, one thing that uh, companies like mine are great at doing is ramping up resources. But doing it at a time like this, your question is spot on, is not easy, right? Because um, as factories shut down, it is hard to uh, get people to come in to work, even on essential product. But what we have been able to do is we have a big medical business. We also have an equally big automotive business, industrial consumer business. So what we have been able to do is to move resources from our automotive business, which has a prolonged shutdown, as all of you know, from our consumer business that is seeing declines to help with our medical business. And what is really cool about this is that you just see people just migrating to it. They're raising their hands and saying, hey, I want to go help, right? Resources from the factory floor all the way out to engineers and senior leaders saying, I want to go help with this effort. Um, so we're, that's how we're managing. We're actually moving resources from different segments of our business that is really now uh, impacted um, you know, negatively and moving it over to our medical business. Um, and we have seen that happening, right? Even last week, we moved 500 of our team members from our one business out to our medical business to help scale up. So that is not the issue. The issue is not resources. The issue is not... Um, you know, square footage in space. The issue really comes down on the part of medical uh, side to test equipment um, and to some extent the supply chain. Next question from Kathy Yu, please. Hi, um, thank you so much for joining. My question, um, when we talk about the supply chain, so much of it coming from China, um, do you have a personal view on whether 
um, companies in the medical supply, uh, medical industry, the healthcare, pharmaceutical industries should actually move towards um, have their supply chain within their own countries. Do you have a personal view on that? So Kathy, my view of both as a customer and as a supplier is to say that um, you know, de-risking and putting the right, right risk mitigation strategies to your company is important to almost every um, CEO, you know, every operations leader within the organization. And for that, um, if you can bring a cost effective and an effective manufacturing supply chain capability closer to your customer demand, then you know you should look at doing it right there is no reason not to the challenge typically has been the balance between how cost effective is it to do it and how um and how effective can it can you be doing it closer to your customer demand if those two come closer and closer together and you're willing to maybe give some in terms of what your expectation is it makes sense to de-risk um and bring um, you know, demand closer to where your end customer uh, market demand is. And uh, so that would be my personal viewpoint, and, but that's not always easy to do because if you think about things like rare earth, um, you know, we're still very, very dependent on a few nations across the world. So I think it's important to be thoughtful about that, uh, that plan. But um, I think if you can find a good linkage between efficient production, um, and uh, you know, finding the resources to do it closer to your customer base, then most companies will uh, will go for that, and I would be supportive of that strategy as a CEO. Next question from Adriana, please. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, my question is around the um, de-risking supply chains and what you said were tendencies or trends that were already happening previous to coronavirus. Um, so specifically with the regard of um, manufacturing moving less so from China to maybe other countries, um, what do you think these long-term effects will be of coronavirus um, on um, maybe more emerging markets uh, for manufacturing? And also, what do you think, uh, to what extent do you think technology or automation will maybe come in um, both in those emerging countries and just uh, more established economies of uh, manufacturing? Uh, to what extent do you think it'll change? Yeah, Adriana, thank you for that question. It's going to make a difference, I'll tell you, because one is in the past, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of these decisions were made because of labor arbitrage, right? Because we were chasing labor arbitrage across the world. Uh, but as that becomes, uh, you know, less of a priority because the way demographics are playing out and the way labor arbitrage no longer uh, is the most important factor and um, and wages are coming closer and closer in the world, you will see a migration of supply base closer to demand. And that will have an effect in terms of having more automation, more robotics uh, in the supply chain. And we're already seeing that, right? Where we've, um, just as an example, we scaled up um, you know, a continuous glucose monitoring um, factory in, um, in, in Chicago. In, um, and if you look at that factory, it is fully automated. Um, you, know, there is a, you know, there is a very uh, experienced workforce in that facility, but it's, we make continuous glucose meters in that facility and it's completely automated, right? The automation and robotics in it is world-class. So you're gonna see the continuous migration of you know, automation and robotics in a lot of facilities, not just because it's moving away from labor arbitrage, it's because automation and robotics is becoming more cost effective and it's becoming more available and there's more flexibility in implementing it. So we're gonna see a migration of that and those two coming closer together. Yufern Pan had a question in or comment, question in chat. Yufern, are you there? Uh, yes, uh, my question was, what are some lessons during this time that we could apply to its um, building more resilient supply chains in the future? Yeah, I would say the biggest lesson uh, to have is almost every organization and company should think about what are your alternate sources of supply and have you thought about uh, you know, making sure that any uh, key component that is 
a very key design requirement has more than one alternate design that you can get an alternate source for uh, for procuring from. So that is super important, right? And companies have been, a lot of industries have been lax about that thought process because it's expensive to re-engineer, it's expensive to redesign. So I think it's important to have a good dual source uh, qualification in mind as you're redesigning your product. I think that's very important. As I would say the second and the most important thing is the whole idea of design for manufacturability becomes even more critical because as you're picking up product and moving it and making it more easier to manufacture things across the world, engineers have to start thinking differently which in the past has not always been the case, right? There's a big disconnect between how people engineer things and how people manufacturing products. So I'm hoping to see lasting change there. And then of course, the, the thing we've talked about a lot is the whole regionalization versus globalization strategy, which I think will be uh, somewhat of a permanent change, um, you know, in the world that will be coming up, I would say over the next decade. Another question from chat from Asha Tanwar. Hi, yeah. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I just wanted to ask, how do you anticipate the supply chain um, would emerge on the other side of the crisis? Um, specifically, kind of what do you expect to be the main changes from what it was pre-COVID times? Yeah, I'd say each one's going to be a little different is the way I would think about it, right? So let me, you have to think about the world supply chain. Let me just go into a little bit more detail in terms of initial products and commodities that are coming out to the final products, right? So like I said, if rare earth is where most products in the world start from, it is going to be hard to think about a permanent change in terms of where the impact of that on the rest of the supply chain. So you're not gonna see a huge change in that in the, in the near future. But if you think about semiconductors, right? What comes after that? You're gonna see definitely changing, not only because of the uh, COVID issue, but because of the trade issue, where semiconductors are manufactured, the investment on it, you're definitely gonna see that world change. Then when you think about simple things like resistors, capacitors, all that, you'd say, well, you know, those are easy things to make. Labor arbitrage is important. Maybe we don't see a significant change in that. But if you think about very complex medical uh, equipment, you know, which are end products, you're probably going to see a more regionalization structure driven to it. So you have to peel the complexity of this end to end by many bite sized pieces to really understand where you're going to see change and where you're not going to see change. And so that's what companies like ours do we've mapped almost everything that goes into every diverse industry from medical to automotive to consumer um, you know to critical infrastructure and we have said where do these end products where, where do these products get made today and do we eventually see a change in it or not so it's a complex conversation and i'd say some are going to see changes in terms of end products some like rare earths is not going to change semiconductors definitely will change. So I think that's, it's important to peel this back in many layers to really understand how it's going to, to work eventually. A very different question from chat also, Marcus Schwartz. Hi, um, my question is from your perspective, kind of business and personal, what kinds of public sector responses do you feel have been most respect uh, most effective in, in responding to COVID? Marcus, thank you for that question. I have been spending an amazing amount of time um, with the public sector in every country in the world over the last um, uh, few months. Uh, and I'd say, you know, some of course are more effective than the others, right? It helps to be um, the form of government that you are in China, where you can make certain large scale decisions and implement it um, in a very effective way um, and actually make it stick and make it work, right? I think Singapore has been amazingly effective because they learned from the effect of SARS and had a game plan that could get deployed very, very quickly in terms of testing, tracking, um, you know, South Korea, we saw them respond extremely well. I would say, you know, in almost every other country outside of that, it has to, it has been a learn as you go process. 
Um, but outside of what federal governments itself and how they are responding or not responding, I would say public sector as a whole, I'll take the US as an example, the, hum the HHS, the Department of HHS, FEMA, you know, the, the focus around FDA, all of them have been extremely cooperative. They're all working very hard. They have changed their mindset on how things are being done. Um, so you are seeing that the, the, if you take the noise and the politics out of this, you are seeing the individual departments and governor's offices and local counties being very effective in terms of coordination and response. The place that I think has been the most challenging, I would say in most governments, has been the ability to collect medical equipment that is needed and distribute that. I'd say outside of some Asian countries, that has been a very ineffective process across the world. And so it's a constant dilemma amongst the CEOs of the world as we are making things where does this go to? Does it get distributed in an effective way? Who gets it first? Who makes that decision? Those have been the most challenging parts of the decision making in terms of cooperation with the, with the public sector. Uh, but I'd say that we have seen competitors, suppliers, customers, you have seen private enterprises, you know, lots of companies come together to make up for some of that gap also in many countries across the world. Um, I'm hoping that the whole world reacts like Singapore, right? We come out of this much stronger in terms of being able to deal with this all from a testing tracking mechanism so we can nip in the bud the next pandemic much quicker than we have done this time. Uh, Andy, maybe let me jump back in here because uh, you know, we started the day with Ken Chenault and uh, Rafi, I think you know him from the Business Roundtable. And uh, we also heard from uh, uh, Ashish Jha uh, this morning talking about uh, leaders being engaged. And, uh, you know, obviously you're very engaged in this, but what advice do you have for our MBA students in terms of, you know, uh, how do they think about these types of crises uh, in the future in their career? Yeah. So what I'll tell you, I mean, I, you know, I think most uh, CEOs will tell you this is that even though most of us have been through, you know, the 2008, um, you know, what happened after 9-11, uh, all those crises that what we have seen this time is something that none of us have seen before. But almost like any other crisis, I think the first thing most uh, leaders in any you know, business will say, the most important thing to do is organize. Um, you know, make sure your, your organization is, uh, is collaborating. They understand the data and the facts. You're well coordinated across your network. So that's almost the first thing everybody pauses to do. And particularly when you see the magnitude of a crisis like this, because sometimes that is hard to recognize, right? You're not seeing the forest through the trees. Um, so first getting organized is really, really important. And when you're getting organized, you can assess what the impact is, you can act on it. So to me, that's super important. The second would be, you know, really communicate, communicate with all stakeholders. It seems very simple, but when you are so driven to get organized and react, you forget to do that. And so communicating to all stakeholders with some level of empathy and optimism is super important for any leader, I think. And having the right balance of that is very important in a time like this because people are looking to you as though you have the answers. You may not, but at least you can have empathy and optimism with what you see. And then I'd say, you know, what I personally feel very strongly about is, um, you know, just before this whole crisis had started a few years, a, a few months ago, we had rewritten the purpose um, for, uh, for Flex. And our, we made it really focus on that other than making great products for our, our customers, that we want to really focus on improving people's lives. And at a time like this, you know, when you're so focused on kind of what needs to happen the next day, you can't forget that purpose. And for us, you know, other than organizing and communicating, keeping ourselves purpose driven, knowing that we're going to do what it takes 
to get our medical business really ramped up. Uh, we're not going to focus on the on what is the end outcome, but really focus on getting enough products out there quickly. I think that elevates the performance of your company, that elevates the performance of your team, and really takes it beyond the day to day. So for me as a leader, I would say, um, yeah, you know, I've learned a lot over the last couple of months uh, working through this crisis, but getting organized, letting the teams launch very quickly, communicating, you know, across the organization, showing empathy, um, you know, showing um, the perspective and on optimism that, you know, there is an end in sight and everything's going to get better. And then not forgetting that your purpose, your core purpose is important. Um, you can't let that go. And that's what drives the organization and keeps your employees motivated. For me, all those three things have been really effective um, in keeping me grounded and keeping us grounded as an organization. And Ravathi, to add to that, uh, when you talk about all the people stepping up to help, I think a lot of that is inspired by your leadership. So my compliments to you on that. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. I think it's really a very useful, you know, frontline perspective on some of the things that are uh, going on in the world in supply chains and manufacturing. Uh, kind of crossing all the borders. So, so uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, Andy and I are going to stay on for uh, a few minutes just to do a program closing. Great. So th thanks for th having me, Willie, and good luck to all of you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, uh, So, Andy? Yes. I will share my screen. You want me to do that? Yes, please. Okay. So folks, I'll just mention we're, we're just going to be on with you for a very few minutes. So if you can stick with us for two or three minutes, we'll have you on your way. Okay. Great. So, so I will, uh, I'll just say a couple of things about MBA's fight COVID-19. I think it's a uh, an organization that is well known uh, to the RCs and ECs at this point. I was hopeful that we would uh, perhaps have some alums uh, on the line still at this point who might not be familiar. And I had talked to uh, Sarika yesterday about, uh, about her project. And um, I think one possible, there we go. I think one possible, uh, uh, nexus of interest with alums would be uh, alums who have suitable projects uh, in mind, uh, particularly projects that could uh, transform themselves into summer internships, which I know are uh, on the minds of the RCs. So uh, alums, if you are watching at this point, uh, mbasfightcovid19.com is the uh, website. And uh, if you wanna take a screenshot of uh, Willie's uh, slide at the moment. And uh, we will also be uh, posting this slide with the recording of uh, these sessions. And that will be disseminated, made available to alumni. So uh, that is a way we hope to get the word out about MBA's fight COVID-19. And it's, it, it, it's very much in keeping with uh, what several of our guests today were talking about. Uh, certainly very much in line with what Ken Chenault was talking about this morning. Uh, so the idea is that, that the uh, MBAs, the RCs, ECs have taken it upon themselves to get involved this way um, is, uh, just makes us so proud of this community. Willie, if you go to the next slide, I think. Uh, uh, okay, so I have to, uh, sorry, I have to grab the screen back. Okay, uh, just a couple other resources. Uh, school news and operational in, uh, information at hbs.edu slash coronavirus. Uh, there is a uh, COVID-19 business impact center uh, where we've collected a lot of faculty research, uh, special programs and tools for managers on managing through the crisis, uh, also uh, available from the, the website. And then COVID-19 impact stories about uh, alumni and faculty making a difference coming out of the healthcare initiative. Uh, finally, uh, oops, finally, we just want to say thank you to all of us, all of you, uh, to our distinguished panelists and moderators, uh, MBA program delivery team and the 
uh, multiple HBS support teams who helped us put the program together today. And thank you all for being here. I hope it was educational and gave you some fresh points of view. So thank you very much. Thank you.